the first of our bills has, has, has set the question for us and the context for us of uh, the challenge of conservation, the challenge of conserving biodiversity um, in the context of a world where, where poverty alleviation is at least equally um, challenging and equally important for all of us um, and indeed for the global community. And uh, we now shift, shift directions slightly um, and our second bill, uh, Dr. Bill Sutherland, Professor Bill Sutherland, um, is, is going to turn and look at things from a biologist's perspective. Um, Bill is uh, a leading conservation biologist um, and has been pioneering new methods in the study of population biology and conservation for quite a while. Um, uh, when, uh, when, when Bill arrived today, um, the second Bill, Bill Sutherland, I commented that he commented that his tie was, uh, was more boring than, than that of the previous speaker and, and, and in fact that he felt he, he was a little bit boring. And in, in fact, Bill Sutherland is, is anything but boring, as, as you will see. Um, we then got to talking and, and he asked me, when was the last time, James, you, you heard me speak? And, and I realized the last time I heard him speak was in a tropical rainforest in Uganda where Bill was addressing a group of European and African students of the Tropical Biology Association. Um, and as you'll see, Bill doesn't generally just give a talk. Um, he generally involves the audience in some way. And at that point, he was, he was trying to illustrate the technique in population ecology of counting animals by capturing individual animals, letting them go and recapturing them, and then knowing which ones you had already previously captured. And people who study frogs usually, usually know which frogs they've previously captured by chopping off the toes of the frogs. Um, and people who study mammals are generally horrified by this, but the people who study frogs say that it, that it doesn't really bother the frogs terribly. Um, so Bill walked into the lecture hall in Uganda and um, with a pair of secateurs that he had brought with him. For, for those of you who are American, that's an, another, another term for, uh, for clippers that you use in your garden. Um, and announced that he was going to do a capture mark recapture experiment with the students. <laughs> uh, at, at which time all the students ran out the door. But um, I, I don't see any secateurs on Bill today. Um, and in fact, um, he'll probably be much more seriously serious today because he's recently been elevated to the exalted position of the Miriam Rothschild, in fact, the first Miriam Rothschild professor in conservation biology at Cambridge University. Cambridge is incredibly lucky to get Bill from the University of East Anglia because he is both a pioneering conservation scientist and also a pioneering teacher. And I'm sure he's going to share a bit of that, that energy with us today, Bill. Thank you, James, for that excessive introduction. I'm pleased. Uh, ye yesterday, I, I, Bill, Bill Adams and I talked at the Wildlife Conservation Society, and they, uh, I talked first, so they called me Bill One. And I said, I thought that was a bit unfair because he got his chair first, so I, thought, I said, I don't think that was right. Uh, they started calling him Alpha Bill. I kind of, I didn't like that very much. But anyway, so I'm delighted to be here. Vasco da Gama, is in the history books for two reasons. He was the first to sail around the Cape of Good Hope, the bottom of Africa. In fact, the Phoenicians probably did it 2,000 years earlier, but he was the first non-Phoenician to sail around the Cape of Good Hope. <laughs> he was also the first to document large-scale loss due to scurvy. As I'm sure you all know, scurvy is a horrible, disgusting disease that kills large numbers of sailors. So not surprisingly, because it's such a big problem, lots of things have been suggested. Uh, one of the first, uh, which isn't surprising given its name, is scurvy grass, uh, lemon juice. You can avoid the sins of the world and resulting divine chastisement. <laughs> uh, you can avoid foul vapor that thins the blood serum. Uh, you could eat turtles. You could eat potatoes and onions. You could be buried up to your neck in the sand. Or you could eat pickled skin. Lots of possible cures. <laughs> and Captain James Lancaster uh, was set to um, uh, go from England to India, and he had four ships in his command. He had the very interesting idea 
of, on one ship, he gave them three teaspoonfuls of lemon juice a day, and the other three ships, he didn't. And then he tried to see what would happen. And there's no scurvy on that, and about a third of the people, more than a third of the people without the lemon juice got scurvy. And technically, this is a, this is, we don't like this. It's not a perfect experiment. It suffers from something called pseudo-replication. But it's a pretty amazing and impressive uh, result. Uh, James Lind was a surgeon in 1747, again going to India. And um, he thought he'd, he'd do the first randomized controlled experiment in medicine. And here is a picture of him doing the experiment. He had a lot of people with scurvy, and he broke them into groups and gave them one of a number of different treatments. So some of them were given a quart of cider a day. Uh, some of these are better than others. Um, <laughs> It was given vinegar three times a day in drool. Uh, Alexia of vitriol, as far as I can understand, that's concentrated sulfuric acid. <laughs> Half pint of seawater. Two oranges and one lemon. Nutmeg, garlic, mustard seeds, horseradish, barley. I, th I think I'd rather get scurvy than have this, I think. But anyway. And then um, he looked to see what would happen. The, um, the people who were given the oranges and lemons got so much better, they were able to help with the experiment and give the others their sulfuric acid. <laughs> so having invented, the randomized uh, sorry, having invented the randomized replicated controlled experiment, James Lind then went on to invent what's a, a key part of current medicine, which is a systematic review. He produced this book, this... I say something about one of my books having a snappy title, but it's nothing compared to this. Uh, he produced this in which he reviewed all the evidence on the effectiveness of treatments for scurvy. And one of the main things he was doing was he was removing all the, all the speculation, all the thought, just he was only interested in what people had observed. And, and, and basically found the answer. So when Captain Cook went round the world, um, uh, he took James Lynn's book with him, and nobody died from scurvy. Uh, so let's go through the, the dates again. Uh, we had the suggested answer. Uh, James Lind showed that it worked. Sorry, James Lancaster showed that it worked. James Lind, with his randomized replicated experiment, showed that it worked. He produced his review, showing that it worked. As a result of that, the British Navy leapt into action... The, the merchant navy didn't want to miss a trick, so they hurriedly followed on. <laughs> and if you look in the meantime, over these two decades, there's a published estimate that about a million sailors died from scurvy. And I don't, that seems a bit of a, perhaps that is true. But certainly, huge numbers of people died from scurvy in the meantime. There are three lessons we can learn from this. The first is that experiments are incredibly powerful in showing what works and what doesn't. The second is that systematically reviewing the evidence can tell you what the answers are. The third one is that even when the evidence is there, even when we know in theory what is happening, there's often a great reluctance to take up that evidence and to act upon it. So here's my second example. Uh, in Britain... Uh, we're interested in reed beds, which are often very uh, rich in biodiversity. Uh, and we, sometimes we cut them, uh, and, a, uh, uh, sorry, and, and a problem with them is if you leave them, they, they get succession takes place and trees and bushes grow and they lose their interest. And you can stop that problem of succession either by cutting or by burning very occasionally. But you're not allowed to burn the reed beds because all the books say it kills the soil uh, animals, and therefore it's unacceptable. So we thought a long time ago, it'd be interesting to carry out an experiment to see how long it takes the animals to recover. And we did. This is just shows the experiment. Here's the area that's been burnt. Then back's the unburnt area. The details don't really matter. If you, re if you remove the vegetation by cutting or burning, it does affect the, the animals. But whether you cut or burn has no difference whatsoever. 
So everybody says it, but there's no evidence that it's true. So I thought, well, that's interesting. I'll find the original source and see how it differs. I'm now convinced there is no original source. That it was, I suspect that someone thought, we know that if you accidentally burn dry grasslands in the summer, then that is catastrophic. And I suspect someone thought, well, that's what happens to dry grasslands. I wonder if it's the same for reed beds. And that was that thought went in as this is the gospel. So we've done various experiments like that and shown that quite a few of those work and quite often the standard information isn't actually true. So how much money do we spend globally on conservation that doesn't work? Here's my back of the envelope calculation. <laughs> we spend about $4 million on conservation and another $4 billion on agri-environment schemes, about $8 billion roughly in total. Here are the, here's the effectiveness uh, for the cases they've studied in medicine. Uh, these are the ones that have shown to be ineffective, and so no longer do them. We did an analysis of agri-environment schemes, and these were those that weren't effective, and those that we studied at the University of East Anglia. So let's take the lowest of those figures. And you're right, so we might be spending three quarters of a billion dollars on ineffective conservation. And I, I'm, I don't intend to publish this. I don't want to bash conservation. The point I want to make is that lots of people say we can't afford to measure what works. I say we can't afford not to measure what works. So uh, if you took books like this, uh, uh, I, I still recommend that you buy these books. <laughs> so we then look to see where practitioners gain their information from. And we see that very little of it actually comes from the published literature. Most of it is from people talking to each other or from their, their common sense or from their previous experience. I then, um, I was at an extremely boring strategy meeting of our, uh, the university I used to be at, and someone mentioned evidence-based medicine, and I followed that up, and I realized that was very interesting. So in 30 years ago, the way that medics worked is that each medic um, gave their advice based on their experience, on reading a few papers, chatting to their colleagues, and so on. And then within that hospital, they then passed that on. So that meant that this hospital here would give this treatment for a given ailment. This hospital here would always give a different treatment for that ailment. You could then say, well, if you look in the literature, you can see that this kills more people than this does. And so Archie Cochrane said, this is completely unacceptable. You can't defend that whatsoever. We need to look at what the evidence is, find out what the best practice is, and then adopt it. And, um, and medicine has done that. Over the last 30 years, they've now got a well-oiled process, uh, so ev evidence-based medicine dominates the way medicine works. And I'd like to suggest that conservation is really back in the 1970s from that point of view, and we're initiating what we hope is going to change the way in which, um, evident, in which conservation will work. So we're on, if, if we're successful, we will change global um, conservation practice. So we don't, we don't expect to do that in the next week or two, but, but we're determined to do it. So it consists of three things. The evidence, systematic review, and dissemination. So for the evidence... The way we did this, we brought together the main conservation bodies, we created a website where we can document uh, people's experiences. So what's the problem? What was the intervention? What happened? And it has to be evidence. We're not interested in people's opinions. And so far, we've got 500 cases, 42 countries, 38 organizations participating. Uh, and it can be, we'll summarize published information or we'll take people's unpublished work. The second stage is the systematic review. I'd like to give one example of that. In, in England and Wales, we spend 20 million pounds a year on in-stream devices uh, to improve fish populations, salmon populations. Uh, certainly, the, uh, we used to remove woody debris from uh, rivers because it was thought to be detrimental. Uh, that, that's less so now. We sort of tend to be quite neutral about it. 
So we did what's called a systematic review, where you pull together all the published information to see what works. Uh, and this is, this is called a forest plot. Um, it's, I think it's called a forest plot because it hides the result behind a forest of incomprehensible information. Um, so um, it's, just, it's just wallpaper. The result it shows is that the hard in-stream devices have a negligible benefit. And I should say we spend 20 million a year in the England and Wales. In North America, you probably spend 10 or 20 pounds that, times that amount. Globally, we probably spend about half a, half a billion pounds a year on these in-stream devices. And the hard ones that most people use don't work. The, the benefits are negligible. If you put in woody debris, the benefits are very strong. So by just looking at the evidence, we can learn an awful lot. And then finally, the dissemination. If you go to your doctor with an ailment, the advice your doctor gives you depends entirely upon this book, clinical evidence, or the website. And this, so if you've got, this is always a dangerous bit, if you've got panic disorder, that seems hugely appropriate. If you've got panic disorder, it'll say, what's the effect of drug treatment for panic disorder? What's the effect of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors? And it'll give you the evidence in terms of the experiments that have taken place and the systematic reviews and say, this is what we know. And our long-term plan is to produce a conservation equivalent of this, which will say, for these particular problems, let's pull together all the information and feed it back and say, this is what we now know. So we often think, well, the funders aren't going to be interested in funding this. You know, the funders just want to hear that everything is successful. But supposing you're a funder and you had a choice between two organizations, one of which tested the effectiveness of interventions, it acknowledged that some worked and some didn't, it disseminated the results, and it continually improved the practice, or another one that says everything we do always works perfectly, which one would you go for? I think we tend to think, we tend to underestimate funders. Funders are sensible, pragmatic people. They want to know the truth. They want to know that you're learning and improving. So to summarize this uh, first part of the talk, um, I think the, the best summary is this quote here, to err is human, but to persist in error is inexcusable. I'd like to think this is my modern, latest, up-to-date quote, but... Um, uh, this, this idea has been around a long time, and we should do it. So in conservation, I'd like to suggest we have two main approaches. If it's a repeated problem, if it's something that happens time and time again, then we can collect and use evidence-based conservation in order to find the solution. But very often there are new problems, or they're particularly complicated problems, and then we need some new techniques. And what I'd like to do is describe here how we've been using predictive models in order to answer these sorts of questions. So this is the, the basic population biology. This is the population size here, and this is what's called density dependence. I'm accused of being obsessed with density dependence. This is the population growth rate. So here, the population may say double. So if there are few individuals, they'll increase. As the population increases, there'll be greater competition for food and for nesting sites um, and those sorts of things. And so the growth rate will go down until it reaches one, where it'll balance itself. And that will be what we call the equilibrium population size. That's where it will level out. Now, suppose we do something horrible to the population. We exploit it, or we chop down their habitat, or something like that, what we effectively do is change the shape of that curve, and so the population will drop from this point here to that point there. So with this sort of framework, we can understand how environmental change will result in changes in the population size. And we're now going to come to the big question of the talk, which thankfully James Deutsch is going to answer. Based on your knowledge, your extensive knowledge of ecology and your extensive working knowledge of conservation, I'd like you to answer the following question. How many direct descendants did the Queen Mother have? Go on. 
You always, you always. Yeah, don't consult. I've got to ask her next. <laughs> I've never seen James stumped for words before. <laughs> Two. Okay. Bill. How many direct descendants did the Queen Mother have? Figure, please. Two. <laughs> Kathy. Two. Sorry? I know. Okay. Right, so I must say, there's clearly something about North Americans. I've did this once, I've only done this once before in the UK, in the US. I did it in Georgia early in the spring. And I asked the professor of ecology how many direct descendants the Queen Mother had, and he said none. <laughs> I then I then asked I then asked another full professor of, of of mating systems and that sort of thing, how many direct descendants the Queen Mother had, and she said one. So anyway, anyway, yeah, anyway, so oops sorry. So um so we studied this problem. Uh, I'm pleased to say this is, our, this is our data of population estimates of the size of the British royal family done at approximately two minute intervals using the process we've just discussed here. <laughs> and I'm, uh, the, the best journal in Europe is the journal of, journal of Animal Ecology. And I'm delighted to say these graphs are published in the Journal of Animal Ecology. So here are our estimates of the British royal family at approximately two minute intervals. The classic way in which you measure density dependence is you plot the population size here and you plot the rate of change in it here. So if, the, so if there's density dependence, if the population is high, you expect it to go down. And if the population is low, you expect it to go up. And this is our data plotted here. You see there's this hugely, strongly significant negative relationship. And if you then plot it all the way back to say, well, what rate would they grow? It's a good job there is density dependence, because otherwise they'd be breeding faster than fruit flies. <laughs> and this is the method that most people use. And the problem it has is that if you've got a high value, this person here who thought that the British, the Queen Mother, had 350 descendants, it's very unlikely that the next estimate is going to be higher. Similarly, James's estimate of two it's very unlikely that the next estimate is going to be lower. So just because of that, it's what's called regression to the mean, you end up with this significant relationship here. And you can't remove a counting error from that process. So if there's any error in estimates, which there always is, you can't measure the density dependence. And this is the main method people use. There are studies when we do measure the density dependence very accurately. This is a bird called the Mauritius kestrel. It was killed largely by insecticide poisoning. It went actually down to four individuals at one time in, in the world. Uh, but this is where it was, it was then it was captive breeding. It was reintroduced to this site in the Bambus Mountains. And this shows how the population increased. This shows how the survival probability went down, mainly of juvenile birds. The clutch size also went down. So we, measure, we can measure everything. We measure it with accuracy. We've got a perfect understanding of the entire population dynamics of this system, of everything we want to know. The downside is that knowing everything isn't sufficient. The reason is, if there's environmental change, then it will change these fundamental parameters. It will change the nature of density dependence. And so we then have to start again. So knowing everything isn't enough. This is kind of depressing. So, so what's the solution? To me, I think the solution is, um, is game theory, which was invented by John Nash. Uh, Princeton, you're probably uh, better known from this. There's a, there's a book, A Wonderful, A Beautiful Life, uh, and, uh, and a very good but not remotely accurate film of the same name. And the idea of game theory is you work out what's the best solution for you to adopt, bearing in mind what everybody else is doing. So for oyster catchers, oyster catchers, uh, I've spent a lot of my life studying oyster catchers, they're fairly nasty animals. So if you've got a stuffed oyster catcher in the territory, they'll come along and attack it and be, be horrible to it. 
And uh, so here's a study of oyster catchers in Sri Monaco in the Netherlands. This was actually carried out by my colleague Bruno Enns. It's a bit of a godlike figure in this area. That uh, seems to have gone to his head. <laughs> And he showed that there are two strategies. They're what are called residents, and residents breed on the edge of the salt marsh, and then they hop down with their chicks and feed on the edge of the salt marsh. So, I'm sorry, on the edge of the mudflat. So this is salt marsh, this is mudflat, and this is the same across section. And so this territory here is a bit of mudflat, a bit of mudflat, and a bit of salt marsh. There are other birds called leapfrogs that have a territory in the middle of the salt marsh. They then fly over. If they take their chicks through here, they get killed. So they fly over, get a worm on the mudflats, fly back, feed it to the chicks, fly back, over and over and over. It's a very inefficient thing to do. So the number of offspring they raise are a third of the numbers that the residents raise. So why be a leapfrog? Well, you can show that it's a game theoretical answer. The benefits turn out to be balanced. So the way in which it works is that you can, if you become a leapfrog, you can become a leapfrog straight away and have a long lifetime of pretty hopeless reproduction. Or, and you can't do both, or you could try to be a resident, but, you, but there's fantastic competition to be a resident. Many individuals die before they actually manage to breed at all. And then once eventually you get to become a resident, you'll have a much shorter, shorter, life, uh, much shorter period but a much higher breeding success. And those two balance each other out. They're equally good strategies. So we can take Bruno's data and produce a game theoretical model to work out what the density dependence will be. At low population sizes, everybody gets a good resident territory. As the population increases, some become leapfrogs, and some of them start queuing to become resident and so don't breed at all. And so the overall breeding success goes down. We know that about half of them return as adults. We know what the adult survival rate is, so we can work out what the equilibrium population size will be. And we can then work out what would happen if we change that. This sort of approach assumes that birds have perfect knowledge. They're sort of signposts out in the countryside saying what are the good habitats and the bad habitats. And, and sometimes there are signposts like that. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do about that? You test the assumptions, you test the predictions in order to see whether or not that seems to be right. So we've been studying ring plovers uh, and seeing whether or not tourism, we studied in Britain, this isn't Britain, you'll probably guess, uh, seeing whether or not uh, tourists on beaches have an effect on bird populations with the fieldwork done by Derwin Liley. Uh, this is a ring plover egg. This is some plasticine made into a shape of a ring plover egg, sprayed with champagne beige paint, dribbled with black paint, put in a bird bag, and then put out on the beach. Uh, we think that they're quite accurate uh, in that the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds Warden started collecting data on some of these nests. <laughs> And someone else reported him to the police for egg collecting. So, so, anyway, and then you look to see what happens, and you see that this one has been attacked by a rat, and you can see the incisor marks here. This has been attacked by a stoat, and you can see the canine marks here. This has been attacked by a hedgehog, you can see the claw marks here, and this has been trodden on by a human. <laughs> and so, using that at different heights of the beach, we can show the predation rate. This doesn't, th these aren't the same as real eggs, but they can give you a relative measure. It shows the predation rate is much higher near the top of the shore, which is where the predators come down for, and so the predation rate is much higher on narrow bits of beaches than broad bits of beaches. And you can see that they much prefer broad bits of beaches. We can also show that they avoid areas where there are a lot of people. We can then put that together to the same sort of game theoretical model, saying how will breeding success change with density? And we can, and here is the um, uh, survival rate, and you can then say, supposing we halve the number of tourists on the beach. Supposing we increase the number of tourists. Or we can try a whole range of scenarios. So you can really predict what's going to happen, uh, rather than the sort of hand-waving that there was before. People just said, oh, yes, human disturbance, it's a problem. We can actually quantify this and predict what the real impact will be. 
And we've also done the same for uh, disturbance in land. We've studied a number of species uh, to see what the impact there was. And you always wonder with your research whether or not you're actually having an impact, whether or not any of it's used. Uh, here's our front page of one. It's not often your, your research is on the front page, but here are three study species, the Dartford warbler, the nightjar, and the woodlark, and that the UK conservation body, because of this work, uh, put um, limits on the housing that would take place. So it was the front page of this national newspaper and three pages inside. And although it implies, you might think they're, they're negative, their they're editorial said that they strongly approved of these moves. So, so doing this sort of work, particularly quantifying effects, can have a real effect on government. I'd just like to make a couple of, ra of wrapping up points. Um, I, um, a, long time, a few years ago, I produced this book here, the, the Conservation Handbook. And, and the reason why you write a book is so you don't, you don't write it for money. If you want to make money, you want to get a paper round or a job in the pub or something like that. That's more, or a job in the bar, sorry. That, that's much more lucrative. You, you, read it, you write a book because you want people to read it. And I discovered that the run-on costs of producing a book is the same as the royalties. So I agreed with the publishers that instead of giving me royalties, they would give me a free copy for everyone that was produced. And the Christensen Fund heard of this and approached me. I like, I like funders approaching me. They uh, said, so that sounds like a plug. Sorry about that. Um, uh, they came and said uh, that they would like to fund the postage for this. And so we've sent out, by Christmas, we'll have sent out 3,500 copies of this book to 160 countries. The British Ecological Society uh, like the idea of this, and what we're doing now is for a whole range of books, we're sending out free copies. And we've discovered that if you start it early enough, publishers are very easy to just produce another couple of hundred copies. They don't notice it in their overall budget, and that can be a very effective way of disseminating information right around the world to young conservationists where it really matters. So how can we progress with conservation? What, we, what we're very good at doing, and what we've done a lot of, is to say, where are the most important areas in the world? Which are the most important species? What are the threats that they're facing? And what are the most important areas, and what are the most important species? A lot of this has been done in, around Cambridge, w World Conservation Monitoring Center, BirdLife International, and various other organizations. But a lot of it's been done um, around here, in New York and Washington. But I think increasingly we need to move forward from rather thinking about the problems to thinking about the solutions. So we want to identify the solutions, and particularly as Bill will emphasize, a lot of those are social interventions that we've got to think about. And then if the solutions are Im implemented, we hope that we can protect or restore biodiversity. I've talked about predictive modeling and research in general, and that can help contribute towards threats, understanding what the threats are, and identifying which solutions work, along with various other um, uh, research methods. Perhaps more importantly, there's this loop here that I think we're missing out of. We need to be monitoring the responses of the interventions documenting the evidence of effectiveness and feeding that background so that we're very much improving what we're doing so that the whole process becomes much more effective and much more efficient. That's the sort of things we feel comfortable about. I think if, if we're to succeed, there's some other things we need to be doing, particularly increasing the capacity of biologists and conservationists, particularly in developing countries, and particularly, I think, using novel techniques. I think the, our traditional, let's do a master's, do a PhD, I think often will be a fairly inappropriate way of doing it. I think we need n novel ways, such as the way of distributing the books, but ways in which we can actually provide intensive advice at a way that doesn't take them away from their home institution for long periods of time. So capacity building seems a crucial part of getting all of this to work. Also, if this is to work, if these are solutions are to be implemented, there has to be the political concerns, there has to be the awareness raising. And I think we need to be doing a lot more of that. We need to be 
talking to policymakers, talking to politicians, bringing them in for training courses, feeding back information. We need to be doing all these sorts of activities that traditional academic conservationists don't normally do. And it seems to me that the, there are lots of exciting opportunities at Cambridge at the moment. Uh, Alison Richard, the um, vice chancellor, is clearly a great vice chancellor. I, I, I just, not just that she's my boss. Um, but she's published on conservation biology. She's just spent two weeks in Madagascar studying primates. She's a primatologist, which I find amazing. I love the idea of a vice chancellor that can put two weeks in her diary to go and do field work. I think that's brilliant. We also have a huge range of conservation organizations around Cambridge, um, and they're coming together within something called the conservation, Cambridge Conservation Forum. And bringing all of this together seems to be really exciting. There seem to be lots of really exciting possibilities. So it's a, it's a great time to, to move there, and I'm very excited with all of that. Thank you. <laughs>